Good evening, everyone. And for our friends around the, around the world watching this, good time of day. Welcome to day two of hope. Just as a reminder, folks, please make sure you're wearing masks in indoor spaces. We really want to try and do our part. On to our next talk. There's actually an interesting connection to the old hotel from this talk. If, you're, if, you're, if you didn't know this, um, MK Ultra has an interesting connection with the Hotel Pennsylvania. Frank Olson, one of the whistleblowers there, was suicided from room 1018A of that hotel. And to talk more about MK Ultra, we have our next speakers, Josh Paulton and Alana Clamp. Great, thank you guys so much. What up, Hope? Where's the manual at? It's not here. Thank you so much for having me. We came all the way from Vancouver, BC, Canada to share this extra special presentation on MK Ultra. If you have been on any dark rabbit holes on the internet, you will have heard of MK Ultra. And today we're gonna look at what is the real MKUltra versus what is the mythology that's been created around it. Great. So my name is Peon, and as a peon, I'm just a lowly figure, but just look at what can be accomplished with open source intelligence. None of the information provided in this talk has used any classified or top secret information. It's just making sense of the whole data of the MK Ultra picture. So <laughs> the mythology around MK Ultra has put it at the top of Lisa Simpson's uh, reasons why she doesn't trust the government. And there must be some good reasons around that if it's on her top of her list. Um, the mythology around MK Ultra is based on the idea of trauma-based mind control. And there are a lot of people on the internet who talk about trauma-based mind control and being a programmed assassin or a sleeper agent, what we call a Manchurian candidate. The mythology has taken off that it MK Ultra was about producing Manchurian candidates. But we're gonna go into a deep dive into the MK Ultra proper, what was uh, the base projects were research grants that sponsored investigators and researchers and PhDs at universities and colleges and other institutions. So we'll review the whole MK Ultra picture of all the sub-projects and see if it compares to the Manchurian candidate idea of it. Um, another idea of MK Ultra, if you ask a pothead, is uh, there's a type of cannabis that's named after MK Ultra, and that is actually an ounce of it right there on the cabinet. And he's licking his lips because it's good stuff, apparently. But people would uh, like to be MK Ultra, it seems, if you're smoking. Um, so, um, in the 1950s, the CIA, CIA director, Alan Dulles, spoke at Stanford University, and there were rumors going around that the Russians or the Chinese were brainwashing prisoners of war, and when our boys were coming back, they were exposing devotion to communism and other ideas. And the CIA and the intelligence world wondered, how was this possible that our boys would flip by being captured, and what were they doing? So the director spoke about the new concept of brain warfare. And he said in his speech, its aim is to condition the mind so that it no longer reacts on a free will or rational basis, but responds to impulses implanted from outside. So their idea was you could create a situation, an environment, or a type of drug, or some sort of a way to get in to, under someone's culture or other backdoor into someone's head that they could program the conscious mind to get them to do what they want them to do or believe what they want them to believe. So on the internet, MK Ultra has come to myth mythologically represent mind control or mental control or other sorts of things, but 
in the original CIA documents, it talks about them devoting 6% of their research and development budget to types of research of an ultra-sensitive nature that they said they cannot and should not be handled by means of contracts which would associate the CIA or the government with the work in question. So the idea was that the MK Ultra projects weren't happening in-house at the CIA, but they were contracting other organizations and universities and institutions to do the work, and they wanted it to have no connection back to them, which finally today we're going to unveil the majority of what had happened in the projects. Uh, and here's the original document from the CIA talking about that ultra-sensitive research is what they were probably referring to. The cryptonym MK was all the projects that the technical services of the CIA were doing, and they were involved with research and development. They were doing chemical, biological, and radiological materials that they could use later on in their secret operations to control human behavior. That was the goal of MKUltra. It was a research and development project to figure out the sciences behind little things they could do to get control over people. Whereas they called MK Delta the operational deployment of these materials. So on June 6, they approved a budget and it got rolling a little while afterwards. The whole project went to about 1965, the last project wrapped up. There were 149 sub-projects in total with 86 institutions, and these were the institutions in North America. Um, there were other international institutions that were involved, but when the CIA and Congress started to disclose these projects, they really kind of avoided uh, mentioning the international organizations for whatever reason. But after MKUltra wrapped up, they did another project called MK Search, which was all the extra research projects that were still ongoing. They finished them up in MK Search. Um, after MKUltra happened, there started to be some public talk or rumors of the CIA uh, experimenting on the public. After Watergate, the CIA really panicked, and the director of the CIA, Helms, ordered that the MKUltra documents would be destroyed. And then after Dr. Gottlieb, Sidney Gottlieb was the overseer of the whole MKUltra project. After he retired, he asked his secretary to destroy some more of his private papers. What we know about MKUltra has come from a, an additional set of documents were, which were financial records that were being stored in the basement of another building. So they avoided being destroyed in the 1970s. So what we've done is to reconstruct uh, an index of all the MKUltra projects using the uh, original financial documents and any other documents that have survived. In, the, in 1975, the Rockefeller Commission, and in 1976, the Church Committee in Congress, they reviewed all the MKUltra documents, and they, of course, had the non-redacted uh, versions, so they could see what was going on in there, and then they produced some public documents based on their reviews. So some of the secrets came out during those reviews, and we can learn about them from that. The result of MKUltra was that President Eisenhower issued an executive order that any intelligence agencies or government agencies had to get their subjects informed consent documented for any research so that uh, what we'll see in MKUltra, they were experimenting on the public uh, kind of willy-nilly. So here is the cover of the uh, review that was done by the Select Committee on Intelligence which they go through a lot of the information on, on human uh, experimentation. And they were especially interested in any radiation experiments that could have happened. The original MKUltra charter did talk about radiation experiments, 
but it seems the only radiation they did was tagging LSD with a radioactive molecule so they could trace it throughout the body. But they had a whole review on the human radiation experiments. And if you are interested in finding the Manchurian candidates, there's interviews by witnesses that uh, spoke at the radiation experiments about other mind control aspects that was covered in the press but didn't make it into these reports. Uh, in 1979, John Marks, he uh, had filed many FOIA requests with the CIA about MKUltra topics, and they finally released uh, 16,000 pages to him. Uh, and he wrote this book, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate. And he reviewed what he could in the projects and came up with uh, a little under half of what had been going on in the programs based on the documents they released to him. The majority of the documents they released were redacted, but some of the researchers were revealed. It was mainly researchers who were responsible for human experimentation that they uh, revealed and confirmed in the documents that they, re that they released to him. Um, the documents <clears throat> that John Marks received were given to the National Security Archive. So if you happen to go uh, to Washington, you can go and possibly check them out. I don't know if his set are classified there. Uh, and he produced this index of projects. Uh, when you file a CIA FOIA, they're very good about it and they get back to you pretty quickly nowadays. You can file them online. They'll send you a manila colored envelope with uh, their address label in the corner, which looks pretty cool to receive. And inside that manila envelope is another white envelope inside, so they're double wrapped. And they both have security tape that's anti-tamper proof. So if you opened it or saw someone tampering, it looks pretty frayed like the one on the bottom. And there is what a FOIA request looks like. This is when the CIA confirms that they have information on a certain topic and they say they'll look into it. Often they'll just send you a letter that says we cannot confirm or deny what you're asking us about and that may be an indicator that it's still a classified project or subject. So in 2000, a doctor named Dr. Colin Ross uh, he went to the CIA headquarters and he had access to review the documents in person. He went in and he was allowed to take a pencil and a pad of paper and he could write notes uh, based on the documents that were being housed, housed at the CIA. And he wrote this great book called The CIA Doctors. And in that document, or in this book, he produced an index of MKUltra projects from what he was able to decipher, from what was known previously, plus from what he was able to learn from being in the CIA and reading the documents in person. Since this excellent book was published, the CIA has released the MKUltra documents onto the internet. You can download them all from the Black Vault, and it's a few gigs of files. The CIA provided a, a pretty rough index of like what are in those documents, but it's a total disorganized mess. But you can go on the, uh, the Black Vault and they have a great collection you can download. Alternatively, you can order a DVD from the uh, CIA for $30 and they'll uh, hook you up with all the documents. Another great website is Doug Valentine has filed a lot of FOIA requests and been really successful, and we're gonna use some of his documents for cracking the MK open. So the CIA did release a highly redacted version of their index of projects, or the 149 sub-projects, and you can see a bunch of them listed there. All the names that haven't been redacted are some of the more common names in MKUltra that have been talked about widely, but the deeper you go in the index, the more redacted it gets. And the description of the projects in here are pretty vague, uh, so even they were pretty tight-lipped about it. Uh, they released a briefing book <clears throat> in 76 when they were doing the review of MKUltra. They produced a booklet of 
details on all the subprojects. But again, the researcher names and the institutions that were responsible are usually blacked out. But we can make good work of that. <laughs> so there's an index of institutions that were involved in MKUltra. And quite a few of them agreed. The institutions were approached by the CIA and they were let known that they had participated in MKUltra. The majority of them were naive and they didn't know that they had participated because they uh, um, were not told originally. Uh, some universities and institutions chose not to be revealed. But you can see in this index, all the institutions are alphabetically listed. So it's a hint to use the ones that are blacked in and we can start placing in institutions that we know or that we figure out or that have been revealed later. And they conveniently put on the right side the sub-projects which were responsible. So this is really helpful. If we crack one subproject, then we could know that the other subproject was the same institution. But it's pretty nice and convenient that they did that for us. There are 44 colleges and universities, 15 research foundations and chemical companies and drug companies, and 12 hospitals and clinics and three penal institutions that participated. These are all the institutions that were confirmed by the CIA and that uh, uh, there's quite a few of them listed that are in there. And sometimes the CIA makes mistakes too. You can see on subproject 120 was Boston University that's being revealed right here today. They just forgot to redact it out on one page, whereas every other instance is blacked out. So whoops, let the secrets out. Sometimes they also confirmed institutions, like once in documents. You can see over the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, it was blacked out originally. And I don't know how they kind of make it look half blacked out, but that's when they later uh, decide to unclassify that institution. So it was originally classified, but then for whatever reason, someone probably filed a FOIA or something, they uh, released the name of it. So we can plug those ones in. In Congress, they confirmed a few institutions. The Georgetown University had <laughs> received hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a building on campus. and. They also were given another grant, a matching grant from the federal government. So the government was mad that they were paying twice for this institution, uh, but you can go there on Georgetown campus. The Lexington Rehabilitation Center is unfortunate. They were testing on prisoners and at the uh, University of Rochester was confirmed in Congress that they were doing those LSD radiation experiments where they tagged the molecule and then they could trace where the LSD went throughout the body of animals. And then it's not clear whether they tried it on humans. Um, these three institutions, Cold Spring Harbor, the Smithsonian, and the University of Delaware, decided just to reveal that they had participated after the initial revelations in the 70s have happened. They have, like in the 90s and 2000s, talked about it in the media more. Um, so this is a list of some institutions that have either been confirmed in the press or that researchers have talked about publicly or that one way or another um, it has come out that they have participated but the institutions themselves and not the CA, they haven't confirmed. So I've called them unconfirmed, but someone or some institution or someplace has said that they were participating. Uh, so when we get into the researchers, they, the CIA gave us uh, a bunch of them that they confirmed participated. The researchers themselves also gave uh, their name for some of them that they uh, had participated and a lot of these researchers 
didn't know that their grants had come from the CIA. So the CIA one day sent them a letter and said, that, remember that grant you got way back when? Yeah, that was from us. Uh, you're welcome. And now you have the reputation of being a CIA scientist when you didn't know. Other um, doctors did know, and if you know, uh, counseling and mental health. Dr. Carl Rogers is the counselor or psychologist that created humanistic uh, psychology. He was also completely witting of the MKUltra project of the true purpose, and he was on the board of a society cutout front called the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology. The CIA decided it was a good way to fund all their research by creating a academic funding grant agency and then funneling the money through that. They filled their board with uh, military uh, members and also psychologists who were witting to the project, but most of the people who were granted through the society were not witting of what was going on. Um, so this document that was released um, in Doug Valentine's FOIA collections is really helpful. So it lists when they were reviewing human involvement in MKUltra, the CIA did an internal review to see what they were responsible with. Any uh, research on humans or on animals was reviewed in this document. And you can see the subproject numbers are listed, whereas the institutions and researchers are blacked out. But again, once you crack one of these research projects, then you know who the researcher is in the other ones. So this document comes in extra handy. Uh, so the methods that I used to crack a lot of the MKUltra projects that were not previously released were these three methods. Sometimes in the documents, they blacked out a researcher's name, but afterwards they gave a very specific academic title and role or job at the university. You can just quote that title and plug it into Google, and the exact same titles will come up for researchers. Um, so you can know who they are just by using their titles, and we'll look at that. Uh, there's a method to look at what the very specific research that was being done in the subproject was. And if you can find that very specific research at an institution, you can also use other clues to link it up, but then you know that that was the research project they're funding. Another method is to use the society that granted the funds. And in academic papers, it's really nice that people give acknowledgments to all their funders. So you can look for the society that was a CIA front and just go through those papers and match the research as it's described in the original CIA documents to the research that happened in the public sphere and you can connect it that way. And by reviewing through the society granting agencies internal uh, reports that they fund, that they produced, you can see the uh, money that was given to researchers. You can then go back to the original CIA documents and connect the exact same funding dollar amount to the CIA documents. So that's another way to connect and know what projects uh, were which. So let's look at subproject 109. This project you can see below in the CIA document was done by the professor and the head of the Department of Pharmaceutical and Medicinal Chemistry College of Pharmacy at an unknown institution. Uh, it just quoted that and put it into Google. And let's see what comes up. Oh, Andrew Laszlo, who was funded by <laughs> the Geschichter Fund for Medical Research, which was another CIA cutout front. We can see the exact same title, the professor and head of the 
uh, Department of Pharmaceutical and Medicinal Chemistry, College of Pharmacy, and it conveniently gives us the university, the University of Tennessee. We can then take that back and plug it into our alphabetical listing to reveal that the Tennessee, University of Tennessee is on the list. Another way to crack a project is to look at such specific research that was being done. So in subproject 97, they told us it happened at Harvard University. They didn't tell us the researcher. And it's into the feasibility of creating a teaching machine to teach foreign languages to their agents. And at that time, it was pretty rare for a teaching machine of languages to be being produced. It seems like this was the only one. And what you know, he talks publicly about creating uh, his language machine, an application of psycholinguistics of language teaching. And we now can see that uh, the author is John B. I can't even see it, Carol. And so we find him. And he also gives acknowledgments to the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology. So we know that he did that. Another method to crack a project is to connect the society that funded it and also to look at the amount that was funded. So below we have the original CIA document talking about this subproject 117 <laughs> was funded for 7,790, $7,790, which is a very specific amount. And when, you know, we could look in the annual reports of the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology. There is the um, Harold Wolf, who is a doctor who created the field of human ecology, and he created this society for the CIA funding. I went through archives <laughs> all over North America to find the reports, and you find them in strange places in uh, researchers' archives. But if you look around enough and are really nice to the librarians, they'll scan you copies when you find them and send them to you. Uh, here's the report from uh, 1960s. Here's another one. And then in that uh, 1961 to 1963 report, we look and wouldn't you know that project for $7,790 was funded by Dr. Yuri Bronfenbrenner. Great, so that matches up. Then we can check uh, what research he was doing and look at the CIA documents to see that it matches. So here is a list by going through all of the institutions that way and using those methods that I just described. Here are all the institutions that are unconfirmed, but it seems that they are the ones responsible. So some of these were confirmed by the CA, and we've also plugged in the unconfirmed ones. So there are the 86 institutions. There's some of them that we still don't know. But of the 88 institutions in that original list, two of them were cross-listed. They were just uh, under different names. And we get about 86% identified. So that's really great. By going through all the research papers of the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology, we can plug in the researchers that seem to be that they did the research. We don't know for sure unless one day the CIA decides to unclassify the information. But if we're matching up public research projects to the original CIA documents, this is likely the list of researchers. And some of these are confirmed again, and some of them we have filled in. The blue colored uh, rows are the ones that we haven't figured out, and we don't know the institutions, or we don't know the researchers. But as you can see, the majority of projects can be known who they are. There were a few projects that I've grayed out in my table that were just uh, money that they were moving around, that it wasn't a research project. So I took those out of the total of the research. But you can see, looking through, uh, we now know 
the majority of the research projects. Except for these institutions. These ones, by the alphabetical list, we know what letter the institution starts with. But some of them I do actually know what they are, but I don't have uh, the right references to prove it. Uh, so this is the list of uh, researchers that are unknown. There are 28 uh, sub-projects that I haven't figured out who the researchers are. In many of the projects, there were a PhD who was the primary researcher who was responsible. But just like now in science, all the work is done by their PhD students uh, or their grad students. And a lot of the projects published PhDs out of these programs. And I don't know if the PhD students were ever told that their PhDs were actually MKUltra. Uh, so, the books that we looked at originally, the Manchurian, can or the search for the Manchurian candidate and the CIA doctors, one was written in the 70s and one was written in 2000. I put a one or a zero for the ones, the subprojects that they definitely knew. I tried to be a little generous, but uh, we filled in the columns thus. You can see the final column. Uh, we've cracked the majority of the projects. So, uh, John Mark got 44.29, the CIA doctors had the same or about, uh, with our projects, we're almost uh, up there, getting almost towards double would be my goal, and there's a few more projects I could figure out if I had access to the libraries, but we're sitting at 80% right now, which is pretty good. Uh, so, let's take a look at some of the publications that came out of MKUltra. So a lot of the sub-projects that are not cracked or not known are those projects which are still uh, classified. All the sub-projects that happened at public institutions in the public eye, you can see the research papers in academic journals. And a lot of it is not what Lisa Simpson would be afraid of, but some of it, it would raise eyebrows probably. Well, let's take a look. So subproject one, a study of the chemical constituents and of the physiological properties of Rivia corimbosa. This was the first project done, and it was done at Stanford University and then moved over to some different places while the researchers went. But this uh, PhD student, Eugene Keeland, he wrote a PhD on the chemistry of these little seeds that they called dream seeds. It was the first psychedelic that the CA could get their hands on. And they tested the chemistry of it. Subproject six, the CIA had asked Eli Lilly Corporation if they would figure out a way to make synthetic LSD. Sandoz Corporation in Switzerland, I believe, they were the ones who had the original patents, and they were making LSD from ergot fungus. But it took a lot of fungus to get some acid going. So the CIA wanted a way to produce a boatload of acid, basically. <laughs> so the Eli Lilly Corporation, uh, the CIA approached them with a <laughs> nice check, and they said they'd do it for free. And this researcher, Richard P. Pyock, I don't know if he ever knew that it was MKUltra, but he created a pathway for LSD from bioamines or something, but it's an inorganic way to produce LSD. In subproject seven, Dr. Harold Abram Abramson was financed by the CIA to discover all the basic properties of LSD. So he basically started with Siamese fighting fish and went from there. They published research on humans and on how they could use it in psychotherapy and um, on chemistry and all sorts of stuff. So he did dozens and dozens in this LSD uh, series of articles. 
So what happened, Frank Olson was involved with some other programs that were uh, before and sort of around MK Ultra. So the story goes that he was at this summer camp that the CIA was using, and Dr. Sidney Gottlieb decided it would be a great test to bring all his agents there or his scientists and see what would happen if he spiked the punch bowl with acid. So he went about and did that, and Frank Olson kind of lost it. Uh, he traveled back home, and he was telling his wife uh, that he had to go to the media or something, or he had to confess that he had done something terrible. We don't know exactly what he was referencing. There has been speculation that uh, in a book by H.P. Alberelli Jr. called A Terrible Mistake, he hypothesized that the mistake <laughs> Frank Olson had done is that they had drugged a whole French city with acid and made the whole town go on mad without explaining to them what happened. They explained that, that that was ergot poisoning, but in that book they hypothesized that that was the secret. I might know some things about the secret too, but yeah, that's another speech. But uh, after he had kind of gone mad, the CIA told them, we'll bring you to a doctor, and they brought them to Dr. Abramson. Dr. Abramson was an allergist, which people have criticized, like why would you bring him the Frank Olson to an allergist, but Dr. Abramson was basically one of the world experts on LSD by using it in his studies. So they had hoped that they could bring them to Dr. Abramson and that he would calm down, but it didn't have that effect. And originally they said, uh, while staying in a room with another agent, that he had run headfirst and jumped out the through the glass and onto falling onto the street. Later on, Frank Olson's children had his body uh, exhumed and they studied and saw that his head had a giant bash to it. So they uh, apologized to the family and gave them some money, I think, and they revised the story that he had maybe been pushed out, maybe. Um, in some Project 54, they were looking at a new theory on the dynamics of brain concussion and brain injury and it was by Arthur G. Gross. This was a project that started in the uh, Navy or the Air Force, and the CIA took it up, but because they were gonna test uh, <laughs> brain concussion methods on cadavers, they didn't wanna get their hands dirty, I don't think, uh, and it was canceled. But you can still read the research paper in the Journal of Neurosurgery. Uh, Subproject 68, we see is an infamous project in um, McGill University in Montreal, Canada. There was Dr. Ewan Cameron, who at the time, he was the president of the World Association of Psychiatry, and he was basically the man when it came to psychiatry. So he had a money coming in across the border uh, from the CIA that funded his supposed mental health treatments where they were playing repetitive verbal sayings into people's ears endlessly while they were high on LSD, while they are isolated in a room. Seems like that would be a great treatment, <laughs> but actually it is horrifying the results that it had. In the research papers, they talk about how great it is, but if you ask the victims who were paid out by the Canadian government and apologized to, it didn't have the desired effect. What they were trying to do was wipe someone's mind clear as if you could clear it like an extra sketch and just start from scratch. But what happens is you do regress someone back to being totally incompetent and uh, totally non-functional. So this is the most infamous MK Ultra project, and it is, uh, there's a lot of focus on 
whether Dr. Cameron knew that he was being sponsored by the CIA. The Canadian government uh, decided that he didn't know, and in the documents it says he was unwitting, but you and Cameron actually had worked for the CIA prior and had a uh, security clearance, so it's possible he might have known. In, uh, oh yeah, and this is a shout out to the Society for the Investigation of Human Ecology in his paper. So you know he was sponsored by them. Um, in subproject 77, they were analyzing the Wesler Adult Intelligence Scale uh, and creating psychological profile tests. Uh, in subproject 117, they were studying, as we learned, Yuri Bronfenbrenner was studying Soviet personality and socialization. In subproject 121, they sent a psychiatrist over to Yoruba, Africa, to learn how psychiatry was done over there uh, by the witch doctors. Uh, in subproject 133, we see microorganisms and acid drainage from a copper mine. And in 134, they were reviewing a study whether you could correlate someone's personality to their body physique. And good luck with that. In 147, human <laughs> pharmacology and addictiveness of certain dextroisomers of synthetic analgesics. They were trying to make synthetic codeine, basically. And it's published at the United Nations. Uh, Alana, did you want to talk about your artwork? So Alana's taken the information from all the subprojects and created an artwork visualization of it. And she's going to say a couple minutes about it. OK, I guess um, for this one, um, this isn't, OK, that's better. Um, so this is just a visualization I did of the information because there's so much data with this project. Um, so in this visualization, I've taken uh, the sort of floor plan of a panopticon prison, which was invented in the 18th century by Jeremy Bentham. And the idea of the panopticon prison, which is probably familiar to a lot of people, but I still think is interesting for this, is that rather than have like a sec one security guard like go through rows of levels of a prison in which the prisoner was aware when they were being monitored, you develop a prison so that there's w only one guard in the center and all the cells are radiating around it. So the prisoners don't have a perception of when they're being watched. This kind of centralizes surveillance and it acts as the surveillance is less directional and more um, sort of interior, so your sense of being surveilled is the thing that is functioning, not necessarily if you are being surveilled. So for this information, I thought that was interesting because I think the MK Ultra project, its legacy sort of surpasses the actual research we were looking at, and it becomes more situated in culture, but also um, sort of people's ideas of this like omnipresent government and um, being surveilled through these programs, or at least having the, the chance of that. So I've taken that. I've also added an eye because um, I like the, I mean, it is just watching you, but also I sort of like that radial pattern. So that's what that looks like without the, um, the floor plan. And then so here is all of the studies and the subprojects. So listed in a radial pattern, and you can zoom into it to see the sort of institutions and the professors who were responsible and the numbers of the subprojects. And then to visualize that data that uh, Josh has uncovered, I've added the green. So those are all the new um, sort of cracked projects. That's, yeah. So you can see with simple open source techniques, we can crack this project wide open. So where are those Manchurian candidates? <laughs> in some project 128, they claimed in some of the extra books on MKUltra that they were testing rapid hypnosis to see if they could hypnotize someone on the spot and make a Manchurian candidate then. It didn't work out, so 
yeah. Here's all the references. Uh, so yeah, now you know if someone asks you why Homer doesn't trust the government. It's maybe more about academic projects, but possibly MKUltra was used as a limited hangout just to cover up more uh, um, still classified projects where the, M uh, the Manchurian candidates maybe were produced. Uh, and thank you so much. Did we have any questions or anyone? <laughs> Um, if you turn this mic on. One of those projects toward the end was something about acid drainage from a copper mine. I assume <laughs> that the copper mine wasn't the brain or something. Like, what, it, what was the acid drainage project about? Do you have any idea? They were looking for certain microorganisms that could cause trouble, basically. They were interested in things like crop destruction or if they could use uh, organisms for other mischief, basically. But it's interesting to see that those research papers have a hidden dual meaning or purpose behind them, but it also contributes to the wider science um, journals and knowledge and everything. Anyone else have a question? Hello, I'm Xander, thanks for the great talk. Um, I'm wondering if your spreadsheets are available. Yes, after this talk it will find its way to the internet and it will be available on my website called joshhealthcare.com. <laughs> I'm actually a registered clinical counselor, so I um, will provide the slides on that website. Um, I also wanted to ask, if I may, um, what, are, what are your thoughts on um, how this relates to InQtel? So uh, this is sort of the CIA's present day um, venture investment arm, and um, uh, it seems there are some, some similarities they invest in fundamental science. So just uh, what are your thoughts on the relationship between the two? Um, well, this was a research and development project, and they were hoping to find some keys to lock, uh, unlock people's minds. They didn't really find what they were looking for so much, but, um, yeah. Uh, any other question? Um. Hello, so what I, um, what I noticed and found interesting was it seemed like uh, the CIA got pretty sloppy with their redactions and you were able to, um, to use these techniques that exploited the sort of sloppiness of the redactions in a number of ways. I was wondering if you've, if you've noticed um, that, or, or if you know anything about like newly, newly released material that's been redacted or, or, or censored, um, if, if they've learned from their mistakes or if there's still sloppiness that people take advantage of. Um, I guess I'm just curious about, um, yeah, if there's been improvement or if they're still pretty sloppy or if they're sloppy in new ways that they weren't previously. Yeah, definitely. They have, I think, learned from the mistakes, but it was the public being concerned and the public starting to learn about it and uh, being afraid of the CIA that made them or kind of forced them to reveal all this. Nowadays, they really, really don't want to disclose things and they want to keep it ultra hidden, uh, which is what this project was supposed to be. As you can see in such a wh wide amount of data, there's always clues that will link up the projects and especially if things happened in the public uh, domain, you can't really keep it secret unless you black out the whole document. So yeah, a lot of people get totally blacked out documents when they do FOIAs or they just get a, we can't confirm or deny, basically. That's usually what you get from them. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. The CIA and the FBI seem to have this history of using uh, proxies to do their work. Um, has you or 
found any interesting ways of, like I know for example that some people have done research into like um, fixed wing aircrafts and identifying the sort of proxy companies that the FBI uses to mm -hmm. identify the fixed wing aircrafts. Have you found any interesting ways of sort of separating the proxies identities and like, okay, this one's, this one's clearly a, a proxy shell company and this one's just a regular company or something? Yeah, they really don't like to talk about their shell companies until it's so blatantly obvious. There's certain laws where they have to disclose funding and uh, with some agencies they have to like talk about what's being funded. Sometimes you have to like read between the lines of what they're telling you is being funded and maybe what they could do with that alternatively. There's usually people who talk though. Uh, researchers often talk about their research uh, somewhere publicly and if you know the very specific science they're talking about and can understand it, you could place just a few words to understand certain research. But yeah, it's impossible to keep humans in black boxes. So that's often the weak spot where info comes out. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, and watch the skies. You'll see all those aircrafts top secret flying around. One last question. Yeah. <laughs> we know about the extensive involvement Canada had with regards to MK Ultra. Were there other countries that cooperated with the CIA and MK Ultra? Yeah. So right before MK Ultra they had a predecessor top secret program called Blueberg, which transformed to Artichoke. In Blueberg, the CIA and Canada and the UK met together for a secret meeting in Montreal, and they basically divvied up who was gonna do which work. So in that original alliance, it was Canada, it was America, and it was the UK. There were researchers from New Zealand and from Australia that came and trained with the doctors. So some people think it was an old boys club where they kind of uh, were exchanging information by the visiting scholars and transporting MKUltra uh, around the world. But yeah, the three main countries, Canada, the UK, and America. Anyways, thank you so much for having me, and I hope that you have a fabulous rest of your hope, and live it up this weekend. Thank you so much.